Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, D. Wood, a.k.a. The Dizzle. And with me now is a detective who's known me for several years and yet has not solved most of the crimes I've committed in my life. Uh, how you doing, Jay? I'm doing well. You know that video you did on the different kinds of, of, of police officers that are out there? Oh, yeah. I watched that. Okay, I was just fascinated by it. And I, and I think there's that it could probably also be said, though, of like different kinds of pastors. <laughs> that are out there. You know, that's what I was thinking as you were saying, you know, but also it could be said probably different kinds of suspects that are out there. Anyway, mm -hmm. my point yeah, is and, that, and really it's it's that in case anyone's wondering, he's talking about my video, uh, why some people hate cops or something like great, that. And, great video, by the way. Yeah. Great video. And uh, well, yeah, well, what that really comes down to is there are different personality types and different personality types uh, get into certain situations and they can behave very differently but yeah it, yeah. yeah it wouldn't matter if you're the the danger of the cop is all of a sudden this guy's got a gun and massive power over other people that's but, right yeah you know, that's right yeah. and i'll tell you that for me as, as a cop who was in the profession about eight years before i got saved it was the gospel mm -hmm. that changed everything for me it changed my perspective on everyone i encountered it changed my perspective on the role i was serving in the community it changed everything it, it turns out the gospel cures every kind of stupid you can think of okay <laughs> including cop stupid so yeah it was, oh well uh, i i think i th even though we're here to talk about your new book uh we, we might want to get into that uh but before yeah, we get yeah, before we get before we get started the one question on everyone's mind since you are a cold case detective uh who killed biggie <laughs> Do you know how many cases I get? I get emails or I get a message on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Hey, can you solve my my brother's death? Can you solve? Me? Yeah, uh -huh. I, oh my goodness, really? So I always tell people that uh, no, <laughs> because <laughs> it would require me to deep dive into the details, right? Yeah. And that's where I'm always lost is on the details. So no, I cannot tell you that. I cannot answer that or any other question that somebody might put in the uh, chat or or actually ask us. Well, that is a huge, huge letdown. I thought we were finally, <laughs> finally going to get a get an answer. Um. <laughs> no, you're not going to get an answer. You, don't, you know, if you're going to get a lie, basically, mm -hmm. I would just say something that's stupid and random, so that won't work. Now, you, you told me, you told me, uh, I think you told me last time that a cold case detective is never like officially retired. That that you could get called up uh, because yeah. some case that you're supposed to be working on. So you could actually like get called tomorrow. And they'd be like, hey, you know, we just got some new info on the Taco, right. the Taco Bell massacre of 82. And you might have That's to right. like jump into and action. Because I was stupid enough to touch the case means that I will always be connected to the case. And at some point appear as the, you know, when I was doing Datelines, what I used to love was I was the guy who was solving the case. And the other detectives who were interviewed were the old guys who didn't solve it. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the problem now. So I'm in danger of being one of the old guys who didn't solve it, right? Mm. Because the only things that are left are the open cases that I just didn't finish. So, so yeah, I hate the idea that I will now be the guy who I used to not want to be on Dayline. That's going to be me. Yeah, there are uh, there are two there are two family mottos in my family. One is if you're going to walk on thin ice, you might as well dance. Grew up on that one. And the other is it ain't a crime if you don't get caught. And uh, right. so I don't know how right. other people are raised. I was raised. It ain't a crime if you don't get caught. And so no, I uh, think that was pretty much the motto I had for many years as well. Um, so so that's why the gospel does change things. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I think happens? Honestly, David, I think what happens is have you heard this, too. It's like we hear this story that, yeah, you know, that we, we hire. We, we're not doing a good job hiring at the point of hire. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we hire these people we shouldn't hire. And then 10 years later, they do something they shouldn't do. And it comes back to who are you hiring? You're hiring a bunch of racists? Here's what I think really happens. What I think really happens is we hire people who are vetted pretty well, as much as you can vet any, but nobody that vets, we, we have a polygraph, we have a psych, we have two oral boards, we have a background search, it's like a like a like proctologist kind of a background search, okay? And then we hire that guy. And I was one of those guys. I was raised in an environment with my mom where uh, she is the most um, loving, kind of accepting it just her and me growing up, just the two of us, and and I, I could not have been in a better place when you hired me. 
And then what happens is you get detailed out and, and dispatched to the worst of, that anyone can offer in your community. You never see anything good. And you get this small kind of microscopic view of culture, which is not real. And you start to think, well, everyone in this group, of whatever group it may be, and I can work in an entirely mono, you know, monochromatic area where you're all the same color. But at some point you're going to say, if you're from that side of the town, they're all like this. No, they're not all like that. That's just all you're getting dispatched to. But what happens is that guy they hired 10 years in becomes the guy who now you're ready to fire because you turned him into this guy. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, is that for me, about eight years in, I got saved. Mm -hmm. And then it changed everything. No longer was I willing to see the world the way it was being presented to me visually or being detailed to a certain detail. I knew that we were all created in God's image, and it just changed the way I saw my own role in the community. So that's why I always say that, you know, the gospel does cure every kind of stupid, including every kind of cop stupid, every kind of cultural stupid, every kind of whatever, bad guy stupid. You name it, it solves it. Mm -hmm. But but for me, I got lucky. I was eight years in and I and I got saved. And, and it kept me from becoming jaded about what I was being dispatched to. Yeah. Um, uh, since there there will be people uh, in the chat uh, and and viewers, of course, later on who may not be familiar with you. I know I know most will be. Um, but if you could just give people uh, your, your your basic story, you know, just, just yeah, a little so bit of background. I, I... I came out of the, I believe I, I'm, a, I'm a cold case detective here in Los Angeles County. I did it for about uh, 25 years uh, and I ended up um, retiring. And, and of course, you have some open cases that kind of follow you. So you get called, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? So I, I still consult. I, the DA, for example, will often call me to help him uh, form a closing argument or form, form a rebuttal or whatever. So I do a lot of that stuff still. Uh, but for me, it was, those are unsolved murders. And that started with me becoming a police officer. And I, it wasn't my plan. I was raised up um, uh, really in the arts. I became, uh, I was a, got a bachelor's degree in design, a master's degree in architecture. I was working as an architect in Los Angeles County in Santa Monica. When I realized that um, the profession of my father was probably going to be a better way to raise kids. It seemed like a noble profession. It seemed like a family profession. It seemed like it had regular hours. Uh, you know, creatives can spend their entire lives at the office because if you tell us, hey, if you work 10 more hours, this will be a better building. I'll work 10 more hours and that's not going to be paid. That's going to be just on salary because I want the thing to be the best it can be. It's my creative expression. And I just knew that would be my life. So I left architecture and I became a police officer and, um, I kind of, I was not a Christian until maybe eight or nine years into the job, about eight years into the job. And then I walked into a church with my wife. Uh, we were not raised in a Christian. I, I was not raised in a Christian setting. I didn't have any family members who were Christians. Didn't know anybody who was a Christian growing up. Uh, my dad's not a Christian, um, although I loved everything about. You know, I, I admired his work. I ended up following him into the profession. But I uh, walked into that church, and this knucklehead pastor was uh, really good at reaching people where we are. And uh, he said a lot of things that first day. But he said that I only went to that church, by the way, because my wife kind of forced me into that church. Hmm. Not forced me. I mean, she, she about three years into her saying, hey, let's go to church, let's go to church, I eventually went to church. Mm -hmm. And I did it just because of, to please her. And ended up um, hearing the pastor say that Jesus was the smartest man who ever lived, which I thought, that's a lie. But I bought a Bible to see if that was true. And that's what started this whole thing for me. And so I just kind of looked at the Bible at first and asked the question, are these Gospels reliable for what they tell me? Well, there's a process in place. You can, you know, I just applied the process I knew to apply to witnesses to see if these were, in fact, witnesses and if they were reliable. And that's how I ended up becoming a Christian. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, you know, my story. Um, and it's, and I'm one of those few people you might meet who would say, well, yeah, well, no, look, I'm not saying that, that Paul, I came to faith through apologetics or through the evidence. But I think the evidence helped me to pull down the barriers that I was I had constructed in front of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So I never would have paid attention to your stupid gospel. Um, but then I, cause I had all these things I thought, this is this is why, this is why, this is why. I needed to go through those things and kind of deconstruct my own skepticism. Mm -hmm. And that's what, um, luckily for me, I was in a place where I had examined eyewitnesses and I knew how to do that. So... So that's what I what I did in order to to, to kind of um, knock down the walls, the barriers that I had built between myself and the gospel. 
And then you started cranking out some books. Eh? <laughs> Well, it wasn't quite that fast. I mean, I probably was a a Christian maybe 15, 10, I don't know how many years I was a Christian. But I was teaching high schoolers. My kids were like six and eight when I got saved. So I just hopped into their Sunday school class. And, of course, the church was like, oh, you're going to be here every week? Well, not necessarily. Well, one of us is going to be here probably because the kid wouldn't just sit still. Oh, you're going to be here? Well, your wife, can you teach this class? Uh, Well, we weren't even Christians yet. But the church we were in said, hey, you know what? Uh, if you can teach the curriculum, you can still help. So we got the curriculum a week before the kids got it, and we figured out what to teach. And before long, we're teaching Sunday school. But by the time I'm a Christian uh, and my kids are getting older, I just followed them. Mm-hmm. And they were like high schoolers. I was their high school pastor by that time. So, I was a believer, and I had actually been to seminary by that time. So were kids like, uh, oh, cool, this guy's a detective, or were they like, uh-oh? We got a detective around here. Well, you know what? I Yeah, a little bit of both. I think when I was working gangs, I had a partner who was much younger than me, and he was hipper than me. And... I, I find that hard to believe. Come on. So... <laughs> yeah, I know, right? We were just talking about before we started, right? You're the old guy in the room. I'm the old guy. So, But I was the old guy then, too. I was probably 40. And no, no, I wasn't really, I was in my thirties. Mm-hmm. This guy was in his twenties, early twenties, and he could speak the language of gangsters. I mean, he would get out of the car. We had soft uniforms. We had a car without a light bar. Our job was to go out and hang out with gangsters all day. And then when someone says, Hey, you know, I'm looking for a guy who's got this over here. Oh, I know who that guy is because we know everybody. So, so we basically would do this every day. And the guy who was young, he was like really uh, cool and he could, speak their language and fit right in and he like they get out of the car he'd speak like i'm mean, what the heck is he even talk? i mean i'm his partner i don't know what mm-hmm. he's talking about and i realized early on i'm not gonna be able to play that game that's not who i am i'm not from that culture and i'm not young enough i'm not so i took a very paternal role and the gangsters responded to the paternal role i played because to be honest with you most of them their dads were locked up or they didn't know their dad was or they didn't have, had a dad who was a deadbeat dad who wasn't really involved in their lives. And if somebody just seemed to care, that went a long way. So as a youth pastor, I knew I couldn't be the cool guy who knew all the songs they were singing. Mm-hmm. But I could be dad. Mm-hmm. And I just uh, was dad. And that was how I, I, I basically served as a youth pastor. Well, now now things are making making sense that you wanted to be a cold case detective because... You could get into the mind of someone who committed a crime like 50 years ago because, you know, because that, that's, that's your mindset, right? <laughs> You're like, I get that. <laughs> Something tells me you were headed that way. Okay, yeah, I, that, but that is true. I, I get why <laughs> old man Smithers killed those people. That's right. <laughs> they, were, that. they were on his lawn. <laughs> They're on right. his lawn, <laughs> I say. Get off my lawn, dang it. Solved. You're, you're, yeah, exactly. I do worry sometimes, though, David, that I that that you can I can get to that point where I start to see that get off my lawn kind of attitude, and so <laughs> I've had that a long time, and I'm <laughs> I'm I'm not even that old. <laughs> well, but my grandfather was not like that. My grandfather Warner, whose name I have, um, he was like this. He he was teachable, mm-hmm. and and he was humble, and um, that gave him a youthful a youthful kind of aspect of his and so i want to be that guy Mm -hmm. i want to be teachable i want to be humble and i want to be um accessible um that's what keeps you young Mm -hmm. i can't look i look at myself in these videos like we're doing this live okay i know when i watch this video i'm going to be very disappointed Mm -hmm. with the fact that i am now at this age i don't feel this age inside but when i see myself i'm like oh really but the reality of it is that age has to i mean i can't fight the chronological issues Mm -hmm. but i can fight the mindset and so I just have to kind of like kind of hang on to the things that my grandfather showed me when we were growing up. He was always the youngest person in the room. And he was like, you know, he died when he was 90. Uh, so I think that this is, you know, I want to be like him. That's funny because, uh, well, the, the, the guys in my family, once they get older, they start losing their faculties. But there's a part of me who thinks that would kind of be fun. Like if I get, you know, if, if I live to 80 and so on, uh, most of the guys in my family die at like 50, uh, but the ones who live and become old, they're, you know, they, they lose their faculties. And I'm just like, man, it, as long as I have accomplished everything I want to accomplish and, you know, I've handed things over to the next generation and so on, I don't know, kind of be cool sitting around. And 
Yeah, I know, and forgetting right? everything. And... I'm with you. I don't mind losing my faculties. I just don't want to lose my continents. Okay. <laughs> faculties. <laughs> care less. Because the great thing about losing your faculties mm-hmm. is as you're losing them, you also lose the fact that you're concerned about losing your faculties. Yeah. You lose them all simultaneously. Who cares? Uh, yeah. So I think that's that. Yeah. You're, I'm with you on that. I agree be, with you on that'd that. That'd be kind of cool. Um, yeah. Now, uh, books. Uh, most people will be familiar with you from uh, Cold Case Christianity. Um but you've got this new book, and I have to say it's a little concerning because mine, mine already came with blood spatters on it. So, I mean, you know what I'm worried about? I mean, this is just an aside, you and I. Uh-huh. That the first version of this has the shiny blood spatter. This is shiny. But I got a, I saw a bunch that don't have that shiny. They just kind of printed them up cheaper. Yeah. So I'm hoping that uh, that stays see the shiny. on. Yeah, it looks you like see? it's actually blood. Yeah, I'm making sure the light shines off it. Yeah, yeah. I like that. No, it looks right. like wet blood. Yes. So, and, I, you, and you know what we did? They sent me a bunch of covers. And when I told them, when they said, hey, you know, they'll typically do this, right? Like I'm always conver- concerned about how the, the book images because of my art background. So I said to them, I- I'm going to tell you what I want. I want a book cover that looks like a fictional novel, I want like a murder mystery. And that's the one they came up with. And I thought, you know, that's that works. But only because... I think the stuff that you and I do is so important. We're making a case for why this is true versus alternatives. But I don't think the church gives a lick about this. I don't think the church really cares much about it. You know, fiction is still the highest. Romance fiction sells more than any other genre to Christians. So we have to kind of figure out how do we make inroads. You so also, that's why we're trying to you know do that. You also got to figure out because you got to figure out who's killing people at Amazon or Zondervan because – Someone's in the so there's a body in the rafters leaking blood all over your stuff. Here. That's right. So that's the anyway, and all, yes. yeah, but all, but all you care is talking about the book. Meanwhile, yes. Bob People is dying. hanging you know, <laughs> hanging from that's the rafters. Right. Right. All right. Well, you know how this is. If you work homicides long enough, you're like really what really matters to me most is what time I'm going to get off. Am I going to mm-hmm. make dinner? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You're, I know your loved one's dead, but but I have a life. Okay. Right. <laughs> so gosh, I think exactly. I think you may be the real psychopath here, Jay. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, I'm on the I'm on the Wikipedia page for Person of Interest. It says Person of Interest is an American science fiction crime drama television series that aired on on CBS from 2011 to 2016. So, tell everyone why did you decide to write a book about this TV show? Starring Jim Caviezel. I That's know, cool. I know, I know. If you Google, well, we're trying to do, actually dump that out. We're trying to bump that off the Wikipedia and replace it with our book. No, the idea of person of interest was, I don't even like, I, I, you know, I never used that term in my entire career. But it started to pop up, I think, after either right before or after 9-11. Mm-hmm. Usually it was it started off with like terrorism and like who's the person of interest, who who is the, the primary witness to something. Um, I saw it used this week um, where, where they're talking with the, the, the kid who's on trial for the, uh, the Kenosha uh, shootings. Like, you know, a person of interest is the person who's chasing him because even victims are being described as persons of interest. So so for, for me, it's a term that if I was going to have a potential suspect, I would just tell you he's a potential suspect. Mm-hmm. I would probably just use those terms. Mm-hmm. Or I wouldn't probably tell you anything because if you're asking me uh, as a as a reporter, I'm not going to tell you anything. You can get that information once the case is filed. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to tell you anything in advance. But I, I do understand that sometimes there's a person of interest. Maybe you're trying to find a potential witness. Like someone said there's a redhead who was wearing a green shirt who was standing. So that's a person of interest to us. If you know anybody who's a red who owns a green shirt who was there on the night of this murder, would you please contact us? We want to identify who that person of interest is so we can interview them. Well, that's different. But if it's a suspect, I typically wouldn't say anything. But I do know that that's an expression that is, is used to identify potential suspects. So what we're doing here is trying to use that, say, hey, who is the potential suspect that turns what we call the first century into the first century? Because mm-hmm. right? it wasn't the first century. You know, it was it was never the first century. It was always um, the, you know, how many centuries into the history of humans? Many centuries. But but the idea here is that we're trying to say, look, this is the potential. This is the suspect. This is the the person of interest who turns history on its side. Okay, so the takeaway from that was, <laughs> do not trust redheads. I agree. Yes. Um, that redhead, I have a redhead. That, I have a redheaded daughter. Okay, oh. so I know this is. I'm gonna tell you just from my experience with Mia that you should not <laughs> trust redheads. 
<laughs> All right. Now, uh, uh, for everyone in the chat, uh, if you've read or if you started to read Person of Interest, uh, let us know your thoughts over there in the chat. Or uh, if you've read one of uh, Jay's earlier books, let's see, you had Cold Case Christianity, you had God's Crime Scene. Was Were there any more? Those are the ones I remember. Forensic Faith is the other forensic, one. Forensic Apologetics Faith. Apologetics book, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you've read any of the, those Apologetics books, let us know uh, in the comments section what you think. And uh, Jay, there, th this is a this is a really really kind of big big book as far as covering uh, you know anything we might want to cover in a short live stream. Um, but why don't you give people a, a taste, uh, and you could go in any direction you want. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go in the direction that you inspired, because it was our talk about a year ago when I was still trying to formulate ideas. It was before I had actually submitted the manuscript. And that's why I mentioned you in the first paragraph of this manuscript, because it was really important. Um, I'm only taking a very 30,000 feet view of the stuff that you deep dive here on this channel constantly. So I, I knew that you were the Jedi master that would uh, I, I was just happy to be the, the you know, the um, the the. Padawan in this sense. Okay, so I want to share with you um, just real quickly um, a presentation. Oops, I, I messed it up already. Dang it. Hang on. I, I, you're going to control that. Why am I doing that? Okay, so here we go. So here's the presentation for, uh, let me, I had this all set up. To, there we go. Now we're good to go. All right, so okay, you'd, li you'd so, like me to put your slides up on the screen? Yes, put the slides on the screen. And I'm you have that You have that great yes. art background. So uh, Yes, this is how I always do it. They gave me we two go. years to develop these presentations first before I began writing. So here's kind of the fuse that leads up to the explosive appearance of Jesus. Here's what we're doing in this book. We're saying, hey, um, if you don't, I do a lot of no body murders, and that's where they, if someone gets gets rid of the body, and they claim this person ran off. Well, what do you do if you have no no evidence in a crime scene? Well, you, you make the case from the fuse leading up to the explosive event and the fallout following. So here's Jesus standing in history, and there's a fuse burning up to the explosive appearance of Jesus. And if you look at that fuse, you'll see that it is the fuse involves three strands, which I describe in the book, and the fallout involves five areas of fallout. Now, all I'm going to do tonight with you is talk about the spiritual fallout. And so here's what I'll, it's up, so because that's something you talk about a lot here when you're talking about Islam. So if you look at Jesus on the timeline of history, you have a fuse leading up to the appearance of Jesus and fallout that follows the appearance of Jesus. Now, there are a number of world religions that are on the fallout side of Jesus. And I've got them listed here. Now, I, I'm putting in new way, a new age, but uh, clearly that's not an organized world religion. But there is a view that's held by many millions of people across the globe. So here so here we have these four kind of theistic or uh, spiritual worldviews. Let's put it that way. Interestingly, you will find Jesus in every one of these. You will find Jesus mentioned because he's either, let's go back, he's either mentioned, merged, or modified. In every one of these, on the pages of the Quran, as of course you know, on the, on the Holy Scripture of Baha'u'llah, the Baha'i faith. So in all of these, even New Agers will mention Jesus in a very admirable way. Now, interestingly, though, there are some world religions, and let's just go back and, and show you those that precede Jesus. Here they are in the fuse. So these are ancient mythologies, and some of these are still active world religions that preceded Jesus. Interestingly, Jesus is also mentioned and merged and modified in these world religions, which makes no sense, right? Because they precede Jesus. But here's the thing. A lot of these extend into the common era. And as the worshipers were worshiping in the common era, they now began to change or include or modify their beliefs to include Jesus. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here's kind of the chronology of Jesus and time. Uh, let's go to something quite ancient, Hinduism. That precedes Jesus. But it turns out that if you read the writings of Hindu leaders today, you will find that they mention Jesus in a fa very uh, favorable light. In fact, they even merge Jesus in, and they consider him to be part of their construct. They're, they're, they consider him to be divine. The world leaders in Hinduism will actually mention Jesus in a favorable way. For example, they will mention the, the, the details of Jesus's life. They not only consider him favorably, they merge and mention his detail. You could reconstruct part of the story of Jesus just from the teaching of the leaders of Hinduism. So, for example, where if you were someplace where Hinduism is uh, dominates the landscape, well, it turns out that Jesus 
you know something about Jesus just from your own Hindu leaders because he is embraced in some way. Now let's take a look at the second Addis. No one's worshiping Addis anymore. But it's interesting that after Addis worshipers enter into the common era, they begin to modify their beliefs. And they begin to modify them in a way that sounds like Christian. Never before. You won't find these descriptions of Addis prior to Jesus. But after Jesus, suddenly Addis, his body did not see corruption just like Jesus. That he somehow, now suddenly the Addis story includes a death and resurrection. This is not something that Jesus borrowed from Addis. This only occurs in Addis worship after Jesus. And for example, Heracles, very similar. The, the, once Heracles is worshipped after Jesus, the worship of Heracles modifies. It changes. Suddenly he takes on the language, the titles of Jesus. He performs the miracles of Jesus. He sounds a lot more like Jesus than he did prior to Jesus. Well, why is that happening? Same is true for Krishna. As a matter of fact, the um, if you look at how people worshipped Krishna prior to Jesus, it's very different. The titles given to, to Krishna prior to Jesus, very different. So again, you see this change occurring based on the influence of Christianity on other world religions. In fact, you'll see that people today who are like Hare Krishna will argue that Jesus is, in their minds, the perfect guru, the, the someone who is sent by God. They even will give him the title of Son of God and Lord. So again, you see this happening. And by the way, they'll also repeat the details. So if you were to look at Hare Krishnas across the globe, you would learn something about Jesus from non-Christians because they are either modifying, mentioning, or merging Jesus in some way. <laughs> so if you look at the Mithras, for example, often this is offered, Mithras is offered as like, oh, the story of Jesus was stolen from Mithras. Well, really study Mithras. Study the Mithraic religion, the mystery religion. You'll see that for the most part, there's nothing similar from Mithras to Jesus until you get post-Jesus. And suddenly the worshipers of Mithras are doing the same things that worshipers of Jesus do. So now and Buddhism is the last ancient, okay, prior to Jesus. Buddhism existed prior to, G to, to Christianity. And you'll see that, that even now the religious leaders within Buddhism will argue that Jesus is within the Buddhist tradition in some way. He's an enlightened teacher. He is uh, somebody who's on his way to Buddhahood, they'll say. Um, also, they'll mention the details related to Jesus' life. So if you are a Buddhist somewhere in the world and you're paying attention to today's Buddhist leaders, you know something about Jesus even though you're not in a Christian environment because Buddhists repeat the story of Jesus. And now this is – so this is all of the people who precede Jesus. And I can just but doing this illustration so you can see that they're modifying, merging, or mentioning Jesus even today for those groups that still worship today. But now let's go to those who follow Jesus, like Islam. Well, I don't need to tell you about this because you already know that there's a role. There's a Jesus is on the pages of the Quran and on the pages of, of Islamic scripture. And you'll see that there he's merged in some way. He's considered uh, in a way that is um, very similar to how he's considered in Christianity, or at least he's venerated in some way. So that if you are a Muslim somewhere in the world, you know something about Jesus built on the true story of Jesus in the way that Muslims have merged or modified or mentioned Jesus in their own scripture. The Baha'i is the same way. Under Baha'i, Jesus is another manifestation of God just as Baha'i. And as a matter of fact, all of this detail of the Gospels is mentioned by Baha'u'llah in the Holy Scriptures of the Baha'i faith. So you can get all of this information from Baha'is about Jesus. And of course, they merge him into their system. They accept him as another manifestation of God. So if you're somewhere in the world where Baha'i is worshipped, well, you know something about Jesus just from your Baha'i scripture and from your Baha'i leadership. And even like Ahmadi Muslims, well, of course, they, they think that Jesus actually uh, visited. And here they get a lot of information that they mention many details about Jesus in their own scripture and from the mouths of their leaders. And they will merge Jesus into their system as a wise teacher. So if you're somewhere in the world where Ahmadi Muslims worship, you know something about Jesus just from your religious system. And finally, we'll go to New Age. 
So new age believers are hard to kind of lock down, kind of like Buddhists and Hindus. You know, there's not like an overarching set of principles I can refer to to say this is what every Muslim, or what every Buddhist thinks, for example, or every – you can't really say that about Buddhists. You can't really say that about Hindus. You can't really say that about new agers either. But what you will see is a veneration of Jesus. They have a tendency to think of Jesus in high regard, and they will merge Jesus in as an example of exemplary behavior, of worldview, all of this stuff as an excellent teacher. So if we're someplace where, where uh, Islam, now here what I've done is I've just given you, this is the overlap. This is all of the systems overlap. So only a few countries on this map are not highlighted. So this is where people know something about Jesus, even though they aren't exposed to Jesus through Christianity. And what do they know? Well, this is the collective data you can get from non-Christian sources related to both the childhood, ministry, teaching, crucifixion, resurrection, disciples, return of Jesus, the titles of Jesus. All of this can be gleaned not from Christian scriptures, but from the worldview of other non-Christian sources. And what's interesting about these is all these folks seek to include Jesus in some way. While Jesus never does the returns of favor, he doesn't do that. In fact, he basically says, no, sorry, uh, folks, to, well, you know, I, I'm the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one's going to come to the Father except through me. So I'm just going to stop right there. Uh, that, that to me was interesting. If you, I'll do one more step. If you look at the, the kind of this is the fuse and the fallout of a typical murder case, you're looking at behaviors the suspect did before she goes missing and then behaviors afterwards to see like what actually happened even though you have no evidence in a crime scene. Well, even if you destroyed every New Testament, you would still know everything you need to know about Jesus just from the fuse and fallout of history. And that's what I'm trying to do in this book, right? To show that, hey, this dude, Jesus, this nobody had more impact on, on, for example, literature than any other historical figure in the history of historical figures. And I could walk through all of these categories of literature. He had more impact, for example, on art than any other character. Any other, uh, um, if you said, oh, well, there's a fictional character that had this kind of impact on, who is it? No, historical figure. There's no other historical figure who's had this impact on, on art. As a matter of fact, you Google all the top artists in every genre of art, and that's what I did for a living. I will tell you that every single artist in every single genre throughout history, the top three artists, they've all painted, etched, sculpted, or, or drawn Jesus of Nazareth. No other historical figure can say that. The same is true for music. The history of music is so utterly dependent. And if you think, well, yeah, it's just Western music. No, actually, it turns out everything now is exported through the stupid glowing rectangles in our hands, okay, the phones. Everything is exported. This impact Jesus has on music is global. And the history of the instruments we play, the musical notation on which we read and write music, harmonies we use within music, all came out of a culture of singing that in Jesus initiated. It was an issue. The Jews had this culture. Uh, David wrote psalms. Jesus sang a hymn, probably a, a psalm of David, at the Lord's Supper. No one has been sung about more than Jesus of Nazareth, period. And all of our educational, if you think you know anything about upper education, the kinds of universities that we know today were founded by Christ followers who were raised up in a worldview that is a teaching worldview. Jesus said, tell you what, make disciples, teaching them everything I have taught you. It, he initiates a teaching culture. And as a matter of fact, all of the scientists in history who mattered, the scientists who founded the major scientific disciplines, for example, during the scientific revolution, Sorry, they're not Muslim. They're Christian. There was a golden age of scientific discovery within Islam, but it was superseded and overwhelmed by the Christian worldview that is now responsible for more founders, fathers, and mothers of Christian dis of uh, scientific disciplines than any other group, than all other groups combined. Not only that, you can reconstruct more about Jesus from science fathers than you can from church fathers. That's how much they wrote about Jesus. And finally, there's the thing we talked about tonight, which is world religions. No one has had this impact on world religions. So this is why I'm gonna stop sharing this, well, I'll let you stop sharing the screen. So, so this is why, David, I am so committed to, um, to this project, because I feel like uh, we just have not been taught this in schools. For the most part, 
we don't hear about this, the impact of Jesus. We've forgotten that we're standing on the shoulders of Jesus of Nazareth and his followers. In, in all the things that mattered to me as an atheist, that was, that was art, literature, music, education, science. Those things would not be as we know them today if not for Christians and not for the worldview inaugurated. The reason why we call the first century, it, there's nobody else who could have done this other than Jesus. And by the way, if there's no other fictional character that has had this kind of impact, it's reasonable to infer that Jesus is not a fictional character. And if there's no other mortal human who has had this kind of impact, then it's reasonable to infer that Jesus is not just a mortal human. He's had the only kind of impact, you can only describe it. If Jesus, if God entered into his own creation, I'm guessing he would have this kind of impact. And that's the kind of impact that Jesus had. Uh, that's interesting. So th that last thing you said right there, um, you could actually make a, a kind of Bayesian argument out of that. I don't mean using a full-fledged uh, Bayes theorem, but... Uh, you can use a modified form of Bayes' theorem to compare hypotheses and say, so if you have this hypothesis that, that Jesus is Lord versus this hypothesis that he's a mere human being or this hypothesis that he is uh, a fictional character, and then you develop expectations based on what you would expect from the hypothesis. So just pretend that you didn't know any of the evidence that you would cover in your book and you say, okay, if Jesus were just this, what would you expect to find? If Jesus were this, what would you expect to find? Oh, if Jesus is actually Lord and this is sort of a God's entering into creation, what would you expect? And uh, and then you say, which 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 would uh, fit the evidence better? Um, it, is, uh, it is interesting that everyone wants a piece of Jesus, right? I mean, everyone wants to have yeah. Jesus, like, I don't, I mean, I don't care whether Muhammad agrees with me or not. I'd be kind of horrified if Muhammad agreed with me on uh, on a lot of things, even though he does. I'm just, I'm kind of joking there. Muhammad, uh, because he because he drew a lot of things from Christian beliefs, you, you do have a lot of similarities, but uh, it would never occur to me if I were inventing something that I have to include Muhammad or I have to include mm -hmm. Buddha or I have to include any of these other people. And yet... And yet, everyone wants Jesus on their side. Yeah, it's interesting to me because I think that that and and I always say it this way: when 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 you were, I had a case one time as a woman who was killed in 1979, and she was pretty promiscuous, and she was pretty uh, had a lot of boyfriends, and so I had a suspect pool of about eight, and I had good reason to have eight in that suspect pool, given the kind of life she was living. But ultimately, I took those eight and I started working through those eight, and one emerged. From the eight. And the reason why he emerged is because he had unique characteristics that the other seven didn't have. So, for example, he had a unique relationship. He had a unique kind of anger level. He had a unique access to her. He had a unique skill set to build the kind of weapon that was actually used in the crime. This separated him from the other seven. And when you see that that uniqueness occurs, where you now you just have seven who seem like they're kind of the same, and then you have the one, um, that kind of gives you a direction in terms of who you should be looking at. Well, something similar happens with Jesus, right, in the sense that um, he offers a unique worldview which excludes any other involvement of any other system. And he, he also offers a, a way to God that is unique in the sense that, you know, it's not what you can do. And then every other system offers a set of checklists. Do this, this, that, 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 and now you have access to God. Uh, whereas he's saying, no, actually, we think you're so lame, you, you can't do any of that stuff. I'm going to do it for you. That, that's a unique view. So it's just that, that the fact that everyone will hat tip and mention him, yet he won't return the favor, it, it seems odd to me. Right. I mean, it's not like he's the first uh, founder of any world religion. He's following Buddhism. He's following Krishna. He's following Hinduism. He's following Zoroaster. These are things that, but, that he doesn't care. He's following even in Judaism. He's saying, no, there's a break here. Yes, he's within that tradition. But now I am the only way to the father. I don't know how you, you know, except through Jesus. I don't know how we that, that's a very different. He's that one suspect in eight that seems to separate himself based on his uniqueness, which is why, you know, honestly, that's I, I, that's one of the reasons why I was so intrigued by him. The more you study other faith systems, the more confidence I had in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as the a lot of the material you cover about the impact 
that Jesus had. Uh, one, it's it's important because lots most apologetics books don't cover any of this unless it's unless it's a you know just a like part of the introduction on the impact of of Jesus. Um, but you know, there's tons of apologetics books that would cover Jesus' resurrection, uh, arguments for the sure. existence of God, things like that. But I was uh, th this really hit home with me. This was several years ago. Um, I did a debate with an atheist at Columbia University. Mm. And after the debate, some of the atheist students uh, asked me if I would come hang out with them because they wanted to uh, they wanted to discuss this stuff more. So I went and was hanging out with they were all Asian. It was like five or six Asian atheist students. And we're all talking. And so I'm sitting there giving arguments. I'm sitting there giving arguments. And here's this argument for the existence of God. And here's this argument for why Jesus is Lord. I'm giving you these arguments. And finally, one of them said, I don't care if it's true. I just care that it's bad. And that, that was shocking to me. That was shocking to me, right? Because I'm thinking, if it's, I don't believe in Islam, and I think Islam is bad. If Islam were true, I would want to know it. I would want to know that that's true. My, you know, mm. if I somehow knew that it was true, my response would not be, "Well, I don't care because it's because it's bad" or something like that. But uh, I, I was listening, and so this 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 student said, "I don't I don't care if it's true. I just care that it's bad." And I was thought this was shocking, and so I asked the student beside him, "Hey, uh, do you agree with that?" And she said yes. And I went all, down the down the line, every last one of them. All agree. They don't care if it's true or not. They only care that that Christianity is bad for the world. And so I thought mm -hmm. that was interesting that I'm sitting here giving arguments to people who do not care about the arguments at all. They only care that they've been convinced from you know watching Dawkins and things like that. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that religion is is bad and all the impact is, has been bad. And so. Uh, I told Paul Copan once, I said, I think this stuff, because Paul Copan covers a lot of stuff about the impact that the Christianity has, has had, and namely wherever missionaries have gone, literacy mm. rates have gone through the roof. Right, um, right. Uh, yeah, wherever we're teaching, we're teaching culture. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, sure. uh, he, he said uh, w women's rights are, are massively increased. And any of you are thinking, no, I know a place where women... Guys, go back before Christianity and, and check out the, the situation. Um, the, the work ethic in what, why Europe took off massively is because uh, there were... There were it, it was like part of Orthodox protestantism that you, a certain work ethic is that work was good it's good to work really hard and so on and uh things just took off and so it's a uh, and then as you were talking about on science um like the atheists almost had me convinced for a while that they that they were the that they were the driving force and stuff and, and so as you go back i mean for the first two centuries the entire scientific revolution everyone there is either a Catholic Christian, a, a Protestant Christian, or some sort of heretical Christian, but they all believe in God. They all believe in the Bible, and not only that, they, they, they put forward as their driving force of their work that they viewed it as a kind of worship. They're actually worshiping God by trying to understand what He has created, because that's going to give you some sort of access to the mind of God. They're viewing it as a as a form of worship, and they only believe that. They only believe that they're going to find these laws of nature and so on because they believe that the the universe is a kind of uh, product of a cosmic architect. And if we've been created in his image and we can think his thoughts after him, then we can actually go and figure all of this out. You would never think any of that as, a, as an atheist, that the universe is going to be governed by all these neat little equations. And so why would you think that as an atheist? They thought that they had to, they had to believe that before they actually went out and discovered it and they they turned out they turned out to be absolutely correct and so on and yet even when i break that down and i give quotations from copernicus and kepler and galileo and all these right. people on what they believed uh, a lot of the online atheists i run into think nope they're all closet atheists they were just closet atheists they were just they were just pretending to be christian uh because that was the culture at the time but undercover they were atheists and there are multiple problems with that namely um, we have their letters and so on too to other private individuals. They they wouldn't need to pretend uh, right. if they're writing their cousin and so on. So yeah. Anyway, no, you're absolutely right. What's so interesting about that? I wanted to not only chronicle the impact that Jesus had, the great impact. Because you're right on science. There's the, the oversized impact of Christians on science is sick. Mm -hmm. That the the, the 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 scientific revolution is darn near entirely Christian, of one denomination or another. 
And it, all the church, all the uh, science fathers, uh, if you just, we started to do this research, we collected a list of about almost a thousand scientists who are Christians who are historically important uh, in science. And we started to see that there was these expressions by secular sources that this is the father of modern astronomy. This is the father of modern biology. This is the father of quantum mechanics. These are Christians. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, let's go back, go back. I want you to we'll make a list of all of the science fathers who are Christ followers. That list is ridiculous. Every major scientific category. And even those that Muslims would say, well, no, we own that. Not, well, actually, you might own a predecessor, but the modern version of this scientific discipline, sorry, it's a Christ follower who formed it. Now, that was so interesting about that is I didn't want just the impact. I said, okay, now let's go back and let's read the personal journals of these science fathers to see what they really believed about Jesus. And it turns out that, yeah, it's true. From the personal journals of the science fathers, you can reconstruct more detail about, in fact, they even quote scripture often. So you can recall scripture quotes than you can from the church fathers. Now think about that for a second. And I am grossly underestimating the amount of information that's retrievable. Here's why. If you go and look for these kinds of sources, where would you go? I mean, we went online, we got books and resources. And for the most part, the religious identity of the science fathers has been scrubbed. So that the, I'm only, I'm sure, only capturing a portion of all of those who were Christ followers. But I got enough list, and it's in the footnotes of the book, that will help people to see that it's not just that they had huge impact. It's like you said, these are not closet atheists. No, actually, in their personal journals, you can reconstruct the story of Jesus, every aspect of the story, his birth, his childhood, his ministry, his mission, his death on the cross, all the miracles he worked. These folks did not, like you said something really important. This idea that, that, that Christian scientists believe they were worshiping God. Now think about that for a second. If you're just a geeked out on physics, you can be a good physics professor because you're geeked out on physics. That's what you like. Mm -hmm. But if you not only are geeked out on physics, but you think that you are worshiping the God who you are bending your knee to, oh, trust me, the level of dedication there is much higher. You're not just geeked out. You're actually worshiping the God of the universe. And that is the amazing thing about all of these science fathers. You're right. Kepler says, we just thought we were, you know, thinking God's thoughts after him, that we were these high priests of the scientific discipline. And we wanted not to venerate our own intellect. We wanted to, to, to venerate the God of all intellect. And, and that's the kind of thing that that level is different. You know, most of us have a, an interest in certain things, but we don't see it as a form of worship. And that drives us to a whole other level of excellence. And so that's why I think you see, there's a lot of reasons why you see this. Look, for the most part, uh, I don't think that, that before Christians came on the planet, this idea of a single orderly God that's distinct from his creation, that matter is not unworthy of our investigation, that we are a people group who in monasteries are willing to get our fingers dirty. We'll touch things. We'll do cadavers. We'll, we'll do all of this. We'll, we'll actually move this discipline that used to be called natural philosophy because it was done entirely with our minds that we are the ones who were touching the sick, who were serving the poor, who were digging them into the dirt to, 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 to harvest crops. And we had no problem then moving toward a physical examination of our philosophies about nature. That simple shift in worldview ignited the sciences. And that's why so many Christ followers uh, that were so deeply involved. By the way, you know this. I, I did a chart of all the scientists who are involved in history, and there's a huge golden age of Islamic endeavors, about to the 12th, 13th, 14th century, mm -hmm. in which Muslims contributed deeply to the sciences, but it stopped. Mm -hmm. Now, we can argue why it stopped, but the modern sciences that we typically think about are not founded by Muslims. They contributed to a progress for sure. But that's why the scientific revolution, I didn't invent that term. That's not a term that's invented by Christians. That's a secular term that is dominated by Christian, hist historically Christian scientists. So I think it's interesting that, that this worldview births science in a way that no other worldview has ever birthed science. It's something for at least, but does it mean that Christianity is true? No, I'm a cumulative case guy. 
I've never gone into a jury trial with one piece of it. I don't even like cases that are sit on one witness. Good luck with that. I would much rather have a cumulative case so these can be a check and balance system in place from evidence. And that's what we have here. That, that This one aspect of history does not demonstrate that Jesus is God. But when you put the whole case together, uh, it's harder, I think, to, to ignore who Jesus really was. And the the scientific aspect kind of it kind of fits the same pattern as the other issues you mentioned in that the religions that came after Jesus, they tried to incorporate him somehow. And even the religions that came before Jesus, they tried to rewrite the script a little bit to include Jesus after Jesus came along. But then you have like the scientific revolution. And now, of course, you have plenty of uh, plenty of atheist scientists now. But yes. It's like they're doing the same thing that Islam did. They're taking some parts that they that 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 they couldn't kind of function without. That that they still want a piece of it. And so, I mean, I'm not talking about them making Jesus a, a great moral teacher and trying to to get him that way. But the idea that this universe is created by a mind, and and you you've seen the the artwork back then. They would depict like. Uh, God, like compasses and so on. That yes. God is this architect and so on. He's he's calculating everything, and so there, on the one hand, there's this idea that a, a a a a powerful mind is behind all of this, and therefore that there you know there are laws governing it, like the same sort of laws that an architect would use, and that we're the kind of thing that can figure this out. That we are the kind of thing that we've been made with the ability to comprehend God's thoughts if we if we give this our attention. And notice, neither one of those things would make any sense on atheism. It wouldn't make any sense to think that there's a mind or that that that, that uh, this this mind use all these laws to govern the universe. And second, why would you think that we're the kinds of things? I mean. We're, yeah, we're smarter than rats, but all of our abilities, our, all of our cognitive faculties, according to the standard atheistic picture, all of our cognitive faculties were selected because they helped us survive and reproduce. So right. they helped it's, it's they, species arrogance that makes us think we're at the top of this. That in other mm -hmm. words, there's not that we that there's no understanding beyond our own that's mm -hmm. necessary. Yeah, you're absolutely. Why mm -hmm. would we trust our own intellect? Yep. If we're not, yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. so I think you're absolutely right about that. And I think this is one of the things that me as an atheist, I, we stand on the shoulders. But I think it's interesting. You know, we talked about how. Uh, Islam seems to, there's a book, you, you probably know a lot more about this than me, The Closing of the Muslim Mind. So I bought this book early on and, and as soon as it was published and kind of wanted to understand why is it that there is a golden age? I, I, here's my fear, David. I don't want there to be a golden age of Christianity mm -hmm. in the sciences. I don't want us to be able to look a thousand years from now and say, oh yeah, you know, there was a time when Christians actually, you know, they, they contributed something. But, you know, now it's like, no, well, look, we're in a danger, I think, for many political reasons. Like, we're in a place right now where this last year, have we not said to ourselves, you know, do we trust the sciences? The sciences are they're trying, to, they're trying to control us with the sciences. They're, I mean, you hear this kind of language. Do, listen, family, do not step out of our leadership role in the sciences when we don't need to. Uh, it's our worldview that, it, that it, it, it ignited the sciences. Don't give that away don't 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 let us fall into this idea that that we can't trust look everything's about inferences i use the same scientific data to make a case for god that the atheists use to make a case against god the data is rather neutral it's being inferred by somebody we as christians have the ability to infer properly from data don't 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 surrender that right now and let them say a thousand years from now there was a golden age for us as well Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, all right. Well, we said we we're going to keep this to to around an hour, so we still got a we still got a few minutes left. So um, you put together your book, your blood blood <laughs> blood spattered, spattered book. blood spattered <laughs> book. Um, any uh, any final thoughts before we close well, out okay, so for, then, for everyone who's watching? Just... Because keep keep in mind there are there are a lot of Muslims watching. There are a lot of other people watching. There are people watching uh, from, from all over the world. And so uh, a lot of the, the information you shared in that short short presentation was, uh, was, uh, was new, so. Well, let me just throw this out to you. It's interesting to me that this is the guy who creates what we call the first century. 
And all of us have that kind of put that on our calendar, right? We, we still mark time this way. It's not the first century of humans, not the first century of humans who record history, but it is called the first century. Why? Why would this be the guy? So if you were to look back at every important, just Google it. I mean, search it on your resources. Look at your books, historical books. Who are the most important historical figures in the first century that would cause this kind of change in our calendar? I looked at all of them. To be honest, all of them combined. You won't even know. I made a list of these in the last chapter. Everyone who appeared in the first century contemporaneous with Jesus. You will only recognize maybe 10% of them. And these are world leaders in different regions, right? They are empire leaders in different regions of the world. And none of them are even re, re, none of them are even memorable, okay? Not only that, if you look at all of those people who were um, empire leaders throughout history, leaders of nations, I've made a list of all of those. And we haven't ordered our calendar around those either. If you make a list of all those people who were deities or said they were deities or religious leaders, uh, we haven't ordered our calendar. How is it that this guy, this nobody, this ancient Jewish sage who only had three years of public ministry, lived in a, born in a small, insignificant, nowhere town, grew up in another insignificant, nowhere town, never traveled more than 200 miles, never led a nation, never wrote a book. Never had a family and children who could descend and actually make a case for him. Never ruled an army. Never wrote a concert. Never had the kind of education that other elites have had, okay? Never had the kind of political connections or social connections they had. Never had a wife. Never never even had the respect of his community. As a matter of fact, he was pursued by those who had power and rejected by the people who were religious. He was abandoned and denied by the people who said they were his followers. Okay, then he was falsely accused, mocked, brutally beaten and executed in a shameful way, and then he has to borrow a grave. Okay, this is the guy who ends up changing our history. This is the guy whose fingerprints can be recovered and whose story can be reconstructed from literature, art, music, education, science, and world religions. How can this be? This is why that, that, that Bayesian kind of experiment you were talking about makes sense to me now. I, I should have probably put it that way in the last chapter. If you look at this and you ask yourself, okay, so what would I expect of that kind of guy? That's not what we get. Now, if you said, okay, if God was to enter into the world, his own creation, wouldn't you expect to find his fingerprints everywhere? This is one of the objections we often hear. How can it be that Jesus is God, the only people who record, what, so four gospel authors, that's it? Well, no, 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 no. Yeah, but you're just not aware. I mean, maybe you haven't been paying attention to all the other literature, art, music, education, and science that's built on that Christian worldview that repeats and reiterates the story of Jesus. Look, folks, this isn't happening for any other religious figure. This just happens to this nobody. Because that nobody ends up being a somebody. It's not a person of interest to begin with. He was never a person. Look, this is what he said. He, he, he accepted worship when people in his generation who were Jews would never have accepted. Do you, you remember Peter? He sees Cornelius, get up off the floor. I'm not I'm just a man. Paul says, no, 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 I'm just a man. He's, don't, don't be worshiping me. Jesus repeatedly accepts the worship at every stage of his life of other humans. He says the angels belong to him. He said he came from a different world. He and the Father were one. He uses the great I am. over. He spoke as God. He never spoke like, hey, the Lord Almighty says. No, he said, I say to you. He he spoke as God, not for God. This is a guy who, who claimed to be God, and it turns out his impact is what you would expect from God. Why would you? And by the way, and everyone else is mentioning it. Everyone else is, if you're listening to this and you're not a Christian, you already have Jesus in your system, and we don't have your leader in our system because it turns out the God of the universe is kind of a jealous God who wants us to give him alone our devotion so it seems to me that i if you're going to start anywhere as a spiritual seeker you should start with jesus because he's everywhere else anyway mm -hmm. so why not just start with him and only he has had this kind of impact on history definitely an awesome place to start well uh thank you jay and for for everyone who's watching if you want to get um if you want to get a copy of person of interest i put a link to uh amazon in the description box so you can just click on that it'll take you to uh, it'll take you to the link on amazon you get the uh you get the uh the hard copy you get it on uh kindle um jay if you ever uh just want to say in closing if there's ever any suspects and you know they're definitely guilty but you just don't have the evidence 
Tell me where to find them. The Dizzle will take care of it. All right. I know. You know what? I was just thinking of you were introducing yourself earlier, David. You have to give me a nickname. I feel like I need a nickname. Okay, uh, you have a nickname. I need a nickname. Although I'm afraid for you to say it right now. Don't say it right now because you'll it'll, I'll be embarrassed of it. Okay. <laughs> But you have to send it to me, and then I will use it from that point on, okay? Because I know you. You're already looking to slam me right now with some goofy nickname. I can tell by looking on your face. Uh, yeah, the first thing that popped into my head was Jay Wizzle. <laughs> that's not a good one. That's not a good one. No, that's right. not, you know what? See, I'm sorry I even brought it up. I All right, yeah. It. We'll we'll, we'll, uh, we'll we'll come up with something. All right. Okay, cool. uh, so everyone watching, uh, grab the book, and thank you, Jay, for, uh, for joining thank us. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. I appreciate you. All right. Catch you all later.